Okay, welcome everybody to the second session. We have a keynote speaker today. Uh, today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Eric Dashafi. Eric is a uh, um, dear alumni here from our Software Engineering uh, Institute for Software uh, Research uh, uh, Group. He is now a principal director at the Aerospace Corporation. He finished his PhD with Dick Taylor here in 2007. Uh, and he is co-author of the uh, software architecture book that uh, they wrote with Dick and Nino. So uh, I'm looking forward to hear what uh, Eric is, go is going to tell us, what uh, his uh, experience is at the space, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody can hear me, I hope. So I look out in the crowd and I uh, feel a lot of pressure because I see an inordinate number of familiar faces out there, which is a good thing. I can't believe it's been almost 20 years since I met some of you. I have vivid memories of going to my first Association for Computing Machinery uh, meeting here at UCI in probably 1995 or 6, and Nino was the featured speaker talking about this thing called uh, the C2 architectural style. And we're all back again. So I want to say, first of all, you all look Fabulous. Nice to you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So uh, uh, Dick asked me to come talk, and I'm going to kind of try to integrate, you know, uh, a, a whole bunch of ideas and experiences that that I've had over uh, that long 20-year period, uh, starting with, uh, you know, I, uh, our our training and experience in software architecture, but also kind of how that has evolved and how I've seen it evolve now uh, uh, in, uh, in at aerospace and, and in some other experiences. Um, the, uh, the talk is called Software Architecture, the Dismal Science. As with all good talks, the title came first and then I filled in the content. Uh, because I think this reflected kind of a gut feeling I had about software architecture, which is, you know, this, is, this was kind of this, this beautiful kind of parochial academic discipline that I studied for many, many years. And then the world encroached on it. I like what Krista said earlier, you know, software is eating the world. This is absolutely true. Software is everywhere. But unfortunately, the world is also eating software. and that. That collision of worlds is, is really impacting uh, how we design and evolve software. So I'll talk about that. Um, what is software architecture? So uh, this is my favorite definition of software architecture. Software architecture is the set of principal design decisions about a system. And I, I like that because it's broad enough to uh, have some implications that I think are true, which is one, that every software system, no matter how big or small, has an architecture because every software system that's built, someone made some decisions about that, and some of those decisions are important. Uh, and so every system has an architecture, but that does not necessarily that, uh, imply that every uh, architecture is equally good. So uh, some, uh, some kind of software systems have architectures that have more careful or better design decisions than others. It also says that in the panoply of design decisions you're going to make when you're designing a software system, some of those decisions are more important than others. Some of those are the decisions that are going to have broader or deeper impacts on the properties of that software system. So those are the decisions that, that imbue the system with its important qualities. And we talk about things in industry like KPIs, key performance indicators, and things like that. You know, how are we going to evaluate whether the software system was successful or not successful? And the design decisions that are, the, that are those design decisions that, that impact that most of all, whether it's successful or not, those are the ones that we can consider architectural. And it also means that, the, that ultimately, you know, there's not some abstract principle that decides whether a design decision is architectural or not. It's the system stakeholders. It's the people that have skin in the game in terms of the design or construction or use of the software that decide what, it, what is the architecture. And it also implies that what is architectural for one system may not be for another. So a system that is a, for example, a high performance computing algorithm, you know, the design decisions around the performance and the parallelization of that, those are going to be the architectural design decisions for that system. Whereas it may not even have a user interface. So usability, for example, may not be architectural for that system. If I'm building a word processor, on the other hand, uh, the design decisions about usability are probably going to be very architectural because those are going to be critical as to whether the system uh, meets its goals or not. <coughs> So why is that so dismal? This sounds great. Okay, we're going to design systems and we're going to make really good decisions and we're going to you know, make decisions that are, that are going to imbue the software with the qualities that we want it to have. Why so dismal? Does anyone know what the original dismal science was, by the way? Economics. economics, okay. And I actually heard a number of different reasons as to why economics was the dismal science. One was uh, that uh, you know, it, it leads you to awful conclusions. That you, know, you find out that there's just not enough food to feed all the people and we're just going to have to kill half of them or something. Or, but you know, the other one that somebody told me that was anything economics, they said, well, it's the dismal science because 
you know, when you, when you do experiments, you know, there's so many confounding factors and there's so many different ways you can make decisions that you really can't ever know whether the experiments you're running are pure and kind of scientific and whether the things you think are happening are actually happening. And so it's kind of dismal in that way. And that kind of resounded with me as, you know, in software architecture because there's never any one right answer and there's all these different forces from the world coming and impacting your world as a software designer or architect that you largely don't have a lot of control over and yet you still have to operate and build good software and make good decisions in that context. And so that's why software architecture, the dismal science. So there is good news. The good news is I am constantly astonished as to how cool software we can build. How, you know, I've seen individuals build software systems nowadays that do things that are just absolutely astonishing that, that one person could build that, you know, especially given you know, the state of software engineering 20 or 30 years ago, where you would have needed teams and you know, infrastructure that just didn't exist. And now, you know, as, as we saw earlier this morning, we have 13-year-old you know, high school kids making $30 million on an app put by putting stuff together and I, making me ask myself what I'm doing with my life, because <laughs> I certainly have never been able to do that. So that's good, okay, but, but the reason that is true is actually undermining some of, uh, some of the, 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 the tried and true software engineering and, and architecture principles we've known. And that is to say, you know, the, the, the things that are happening out in the world are eroding our abilities as architects and designers to make those principal software, those principal uh, design decisions about our software systems for ourselves. That is to say, again, many of the principal design decisions or the architectural design decisions about your systems are that you're, that in the software systems you're building today, are being made by not you. They're being made by other people. They're not even being made by other people you know. They're being made by other people who build big components and frameworks that you are going to use, and they don't know you. They probably don't even like you. So what does that mean for architecture? How do we get software systems that have all of those qualities we want when the ability to make principal design decisions about those systems has been taken from our hands? Another phenomenon we see happening is that abstraction layers are leaking. Abstraction is the key power of software architecture and software engineering that makes us able to build systems bigger than ourselves, right? Humans can remember five plus or minus two or seven plus or minus two things in your head at one time. And so we're limited, you know, if we, if we could all remember everything, we could build software amazingly. There's some research being done right across the quad there. Apparently there's some woman who walked into the UCI Neurology Center and said, I remember everything that's ever happened to me since I was two years old. If we all were like that, we would all be amazing software engineers because we'd be able to remember all the thousands and thousands of details about how we build software. But we're not all like that. We remember seven plus or minus two things. And so we need abstraction. We need that ability to be able to forget things or put things aside or work at a higher level and work at a higher level of principles instead of details. And that's how we build these big systems. But those abstraction layers are leaking in on us. There's nothing we can do about that. And yet we still have to build these systems. So when I was in school, not so many years ago, although that number is growing every year, um, this is what we taught people. How do you go about building a big software system? Well, this is the rational design process. We identify all the key stakeholders, right? Because the stakeholders are the ones, they have skin in the game. So we're going to get all of them together, and those stakeholders are going to have a big meeting, and they're going to agree on all the important functional and non-functional requirements or illities of the software system. What is this thing going to do, and how is it going to do it? How is it going to perform? How usable is it going to be? What are those key performance indicators or key performance parameters we're going to imbue in the system? Then, knowing that, we're going to look around at all the different architectural styles that are out there, and we're either going to choose or hybridize a couple of those styles. And those are sets of rules that we are going to apply in our development that are going to guarantee that we get those outcomes. We're going to say, okay, we're going to have separation of concerns here. We're going to have these uh, you know, elements communicate in these particular ways. Krista's talk talked about you know, architectural styles effectively for large collaborative simulation systems, which is, okay, we're going to have something that I, I, I think you would say is like a blackboard system. So we have a big data store that's communicating with a lot of different components. That's an architectural style. We're going to choose that because that's going to imbue the system with the evolvability, the maintainability, you know, the distribution, and the, you know, and the performance that we want to get out of the system. It's an excellent thing to do. We're going to then say, okay, based on this style, we're going to choose a development platform, an employment platform that's going to help us implement in the style. We're going to select an architectural framework or we're going to build tools or middleware that's going to help us implement those things. And then we're going to iterate through the development process and we're going to build the system, you know, keeping in mind these high level architectural principles and keeping the style clean and, and throughout the system the whole time. 
That's the rational design process. But the world encroaches on this beautiful academic design process. And what are some trends we're seeing? And I'll talk about each one of these in turn a little bit if I have time. So the big one I see happening is something I call Framework of Palooza. I hope that all of you have encountered this at some point. Framework of Palooza is, you know, to be the, the thing that lets us build these big awesome systems is that we have a lot of infrastructure under us that we can build on top of. So there's a huge mountain of framework that does a lot of stuff for us, and we're building a little tiny hut on top of that mountain. That's all we're responsible for. But you get the benefits of the whole mountain. Uh, the problem with the increased reliance there, of course, is that that is where a lot of those architectural design decisions are being made by other people. Uh, another trend I see in particular in my organization, uh, I actually am not in the engineering organization anymore, I'm in the IT organization, but still responsible for uh, 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 the development of internal corporate business applications. And you know, a lot of the times, we're not even building software with traditional programming languages anymore. We're building, you know, the good news, again, good news, bad news, good news. You remember domain-specific software engineering, domain-specific software architecture? It worked, yay! What's the bad news? It didn't work quite like we thought it was going to be. What it ended up developing was a tremendous number of what I call domain-specific mega-platforms where you have, you know, domains like the domain of business applications with workflows where, you know, there is tremendous, you know, lucrativeness and the ability to build these giant platforms that, that are middleware writ large and support all these processes, but it's not even clear that it's software engineering anymore. And we'll talk about, you know, it actually is software engineering, but a lot of the people building on those platforms don't know that, and that's a big risk. Uh, agile methods, uh, the, uh, I don't want to call them kids, the earlier career professionals coming out of school that join our group, think that Agile is absolutely normal. You know, they, they, they didn't even learn waterfall. They just, you know, Agile is, is the right, the one true way of doing things. And Agile methods are great, but they encourage this very kind of, you know, detail-oriented, looking in the small, deferment of commitment to the last moment about when you make these design decisions. And so high-level architecture, that kind of top-down requirements and, and quality-driven architecture, mm, how is that compatible with Agile? That's, a, that's an issue. And finally, the leaking abstractions that I mentioned earlier. So from the rational process to the actual design process, this is what my developers do when they go to build an app. They go find some stakeholders. Oh, but this is written in my very first programming language. I learned Commodore 128 Basic. Uh, so, I, you know, so you guys will be familiar with the control flow. You identify some stakeholders. First thing you do is after you talk to them, you mock up a user interface in Balsamic. You know, we're not talking about functional requirements. Hey, how's this look? Does this look good? Does it, what if the button was over here? What if there was a people picker over here? Can we do that? Um, we have to pick a hot framework right off the bat, and today that hot framework is Angular because it has to be because everybody's using Angular, and you're a total scrub if we're not using Angular, so we're going to pick that. Um, Angular doesn't do everything that we're going to do, so we're going to have to pick a couple of other really hot frameworks to use. So we'll probably pick Bootstrap and jQuery, although Angular and jQuery, they're not kind of exactly compatible, but you need a little bit of one or the other. Um, we're going to take, you know, kind of what the stakeholders were telling us. You know, they didn't tell us the whole story, but that's okay because we're doing Agile. We're going to put all of our Agile user stories in Jira. And then we're going to have the, uh, the product owner say, mm, these are the ones that are really important to me. And the, uh, the, the Scrum Master is going to look at that list and they're going to look down the list and they're going to draw a line. And they're going to say, everything above this line we can do in the next two weeks. We're going to pick off that two weeks of stories. And we're going to sprint, 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 because that's what we do in Agile. We do Scrum, we do sprinting. We build these two weeks of user stories, and then we just go do it again. We just keep picking stories off the queue and implementing, and occasionally we throw some more stories on the queue. I don't know where the design happens in here. It does happen, but it, it's not part of the process, and this is a big concern when we're trying to imbue these systems with global qualities and we're trying to make these things maintainable and usable over time. And so that's, the, that's you know, why, why I worry about software architecture. Talk about the, the issues. So every vendor, now that I'm in IT, I get inundated with vendor presentations. This is something that as software engineers you may avoid. I recommend you continue to avoid it if you can. Every vendor that comes in has a wall of fame in their slide deck. Every slide deck looks exactly the same. Here's who we are. Here's you know what our value proposition is with a lot of big, blousy words that you don't understand. And then they tell you, if they're new, they tell you where they just got their venture capital from. But they always have the wall of fame, and the wall of fame has the logos of every single company or customer that they have done work for ever. Even if they only met with them for 10 minutes, their logo goes up on the wall of fame. So here I have walls of shame, something like that. Anyway, so you know, I, I just wanted to kind of you know give you some visceral insight into the, the world of a modern you know kind of earlier career professional software engineer that comes out. So 
the great thing about frameworks is there's a zillion of them. And these are only the popular ones. These are the ones that I've actually heard of and know something about. There's hundreds and hundreds of more or less popular ones that you could absolutely pick. These all do very different things. Most of these are web frameworks, but some of them are more domain specific in other ways. Um, I would say that at Aerospace, in my organization, probably 25% of these are used on a regular basis, which is a little scary, maybe, maybe more. And you know, more, more broadly in the, the FFRDC community, I know uh, probably close to 100% of them are used somewhere. So there are frameworks everywhere. And frameworks, frameworks do a lot for you. Like I said, you know, what, what are, you know, we, we call them middleware, we call them frameworks. Sometimes we call it a platform or a stack. And what we're basically talking about here is these are pieces of software that sit somewhere between your application and the underlying programming language and operating system that you get. So you pick a programming language, that gives you some features, that's running on an operating system, that has a runtime library. But depending on what kind of application you're building or what you're doing, that's usually not enough. You usually need more functionality, and those things sit in the middle. That's why it's middleware between your application and the programming language, and they provide additional services. And why, why do we love frameworks so much? Well, because you know, oftentimes you know, we, we want to do something in one way and the programming language doesn't make that easy and so it, the, the frameworks can kind of smooth that out. They can make certain kind of inelegant programming tasks easier. They can provide services like communication or connector services or functional services that the programming language uh, runtime library doesn't have. You know, maybe you need a map component, maybe you need certain user interface widgets, things like that. Uh, they can help you with architecture. They can help to enforce architectural d rules or constraints that elicit beneficial properties. But again, when you pick a framework, it's the framework that picks which properties it's going to support, not necessarily you. And then sometimes because some people just want to write one programming language and another. You know, sometimes there's just, you know, there's people that say, well, I have to build this thing in Java, but I really, really like functional programming, and I can't convince my boss I want to use Scala or something like that. So. They get a library from Google, sorry, but you, know, there's a, you get a really cool library from Google that let you do list comprehensions in Java. And that is the ugliest looking code you have ever seen in your entire life. And it's just wrong. Uh, you know, it's, if you wanted to just pick a programming, just pick a functional programming language, okay? Just, just pick one, it's okay. Um, if for loops are not that bad. You will survive for loops. You know, trying to have list comprehensions in Java is just, now you can do it with lambdas, but you couldn't do it with so frameworks are a big thing. Everybody loves frameworks because they do so much for us. What is the relationship between frameworks and, uh, and architecture? And this was actually called out as one of my favorite papers. Danita and Rosa Bloom from uh, ICSI 99 uh, uh, clarified this relationship. And I think this is absolutely true, and it's always been true. Uh, and that is that, uh, that architecture framework, or that, that middleware and, and frameworks induce an architectural style. That is to say, they live down there and they make fundamental decisions about how the software will be built and organized and evolved and how it will interact with other pieces of software. And in doing so, it basically makes a set of principal design decisions about the system. And so by choosing, frame, by choosing a framework, you are necessarily importing that set of principal design decisions into your design. And maybe those are ones you want and maybe those aren't. And often, it's not possible to tease out, I only want these principal design decisions, but not these ones, because the framework comes as a whole package. And depending on how the framework is constructed, it may or may not be easy to, uh, to tease that apart. Um, sometimes this can be supportive of architecture, and sometimes it isn't. So you know, research here at UC Irvine, research that I did and many other people did at USC and, and Nino's group and others, uh, built frameworks, built middleware that we call architecture frameworks, where we actually started with an architectural style and then built a framework specifically to implement the constraints of that style. That is a good way to bridge, to bridge frameworks and architecture, but it's few and far between. And largely, this has kind of been you know, stuff that's come out of the lab. We don't really see that coming out of, out of industry. We don't see the, the folks that build Angular or CodeIgniter say, you know, we picked an architectural style and we built our middleware to implement the constraints of that style. And that's, that, that's too bad. So, you know, it, as you choose frameworks, you, you are seeding your kind of, your, your ability to architect your system to whoever, cho whoever built the framework. Why is this a problem? Well, <clears throat> framework selection occurs very early in development. As I said, you know, even when we're not doing the, the, the rational design process, it happens like right on line 30. It happens almost right after we do the uh, the requirements, so we pick this. Uh, you know, we pick these frameworks very early, often before you even understand what the functional requirements or the or the key qualities of your system are supposed to be. Because we have to do development, and you start doing development on the framework. You can't really start doing development without the framework because everything lives on the framework, and so you kind of have to pick this very early. 
And the dismal part of that is you have to pick it at the time when you're probably least equipped to make that really, really amazingly big decision. And worse yet, once you make that decision, the, it's, it's really, really hard to change. Because if you pick the wrong framework, any development you've done, you know, it's kind of like replacing the house without, you know, replacing the foundation without making the house move. You can't do it. You have to undo all of this work you did. So this is a real big problem. Uh, also, you know, you don't always choose the framework based on, or, or the programming language or whatever, based on the fact that it was the technically best. Maybe that's what you've got the skill set to build with. Maybe that's just what's really hot right now. Maybe that's you know, what, uh, you know, what you think will be sustainable in the long term. Uh, I was just at a meeting with, uh, uh, we, every, uh, every couple of months, the, the chief information officers of all the federally funded research and development centers like ours get together uh, to talk about, well, we complain about the government and other things like that and security, but one of the things we talk about is kind of common problems that we have, and uh, this is being recorded, right? So there was another <laughs> FFRDC there, and I won't mention which one. They're in Pittsburgh. <laughs> they have software concerns, but I'm not going to say which one. And their CIO was there and said, you know, I build applications and I have, I have teams that basically have this framework of Palooza problem. I have three different teams that know how to build in three different completely, uh, you know, uh, completely separate frameworks and programming languages and everything like that. And so he said, I have a problem because how you go about, you know, how we go about choosing which application, when an application request comes in, we're going to build this, how we go about choosing which platform it's going to be built on has really been driven a lot by who's got the time to do it and not really the architecture. And it's like, ooh, that's really tough, right? You know, and you'd expect exactly the opposite from an F4DC that you know, has all this process and stuff. But it just shows. And I'm, and I'm, not, I'm not bagging on them. And you know, he, said, he admitted, yes, we're changing this and we've got a much better process now. And we're, we're, we're looking more, you know, much more requirements driven. But you know, it's really tough. Extrinsic factors are a huge impact on how you go about choosing stuff to, to build uh, and how you build it. Um, Frameworks may mismatch with your intended architecture. A lot of these frameworks were not built to go together, but since they don't all do everything you need, you have to integrate them anyway. These are, these are big problems. And so what can you do about that as an architect? So you can't get rid of frameworks. You absolutely can't. You're going you're gonna to live there. So I kind of, for, for each of these things, I have the scale of from bad ideas to good ideas. I think the worst idea you have is, you can, is fighting your framework. Is, is I have a framework and I'm not going to accept those principal design decisions. I'm just going to, every time I see something I don't like, I'm going to write the code another way. Ugh, that, that's a bad idea. You know, what you should do is something more on the good side, which is you know, maybe build a mini framework on your frameworks. That is to say, you know, choose your frameworks, understand carefully what they do, what the, what the principal design decisions are that have been put on you, and then say, I'm going to build a little bit of stuff on top of that to either integrate the frameworks or to provide myself my own mini platform that is going to get me closer to the architecture style, the, ar the, the principal design decisions that I want. And that, that tends to work out okay. Um, somewhere in the middle, you know, write your own framework. Ooh, that's, that's the siren song. Everybody loves writing frameworks, especially software architects. How many of you guys consider yourself software designers? How many of you guys love writing frameworks? I know I do. I, got, I managed to convince Dick to give me a whole PhD for basically doing just that, so that was awesome. Um, but uh, writing your own framework, you know, that is, that, that is fraught with peril because, again, you know, that, that's a, the point of frameworks is that somebody else is writing these, you get all these benefits, and you don't incur those costs. You get to just kind of import them yourself, and you get to take advantage of, uh, of all those benefits. And someone else is going to maintain that framework. And that's both a benefit and a risk, because if they maintain it in a way that kind of diverges from your interests, well, you're in trouble. Uh, but in general, writing your own framework, yeah, you can do it, but it's a little tough. It be better in this case to choose frameworks that are out there and adapt them to your needs. Uh, and again, like I said, writing one language and another, just don't do it. So frameworks are great, but frameworks are are relatively small compared to the domain-specific mega platforms that are out there. And so these are, these are a lot that I encounter in my world where we're implementing uh, business platforms. You'll see a lot of things in there. You'll see uh, like ServiceNow and SharePoint and Force.com. These are um, cases wherein a, a company, like let's say Salesforce, we'll take them for an example, um, they wanted to build a big, huge system in a particular vertical market, in their case, customer relationship management, Salesforce. You've all heard of this. The Salesforce is the, is the system. In doing so, they had to build their whole internal platform, and they had to expose a lot of that internal platform 
to their customers for customization. And so because their customers want to customize how the forms look and how the workflows look and how the database is structured and what kind of stuff they capture and what systems they integrate with, they ended up exposing a lot of that platform to customers. And then they said, wait a minute, there are customers that just could buy the platform and they don't need the CRM system at all. And so they, they've been splitting off. So you see Salesforce, the system with its customization, but you can also get an account that just gives you force.com, the, de the development platform. And it is indeed, in every way, a domain-specific domain software engineering platform where the top-level objects are you know, forms, workflows, reports, things like that. And so you can build very cool stuff, but these dominate your universe when you're an application developer. Right? You, you know, even, it goes back, you know, Lotus Notes probably one of the earliest examples. We were a Lotus Notes shop for a long time. That's not really the Lotus Notes logo. It doesn't, that's not really their tagline, but I love that one when I was searching the internet. Yeah, I can do that too. We had, we had a whole shop that said, yeah, I can do that too. That, we heard that all the time. About that. So software built on these platforms, you know, they are software applications, and they have the same life cycle needs as traditional software. You, know, you have to do requirements and design and implementation and testing and maintenance. Whether you do that in an agile way or, or in a traditional kind of waterfall way is up to you. Uh, but they have these additional first class domain objects. So this is, this is frameworks that reach all the way up to the very bottom of the application stack and, and impact you. Um, Often, instead of just code, uh, these software in these platforms is built by both configuration, pointing and clicking, and code. So it's not always clear what the code is, and that's an issue we'll talk about. And the value proposition, of course, is that you know, because it's a domain-specific platform, you can churn out these applications much more quickly than if I had a bunch of Java developers go do this with Bootstrap and MySQL and stuff like that. But I, I'm living in this, in this tightly bound world. and so. You have all the same key issues you have with frameworks, but worse, because you've got licensing and lock-in concerns. You are kind of totally beholden to the platform. Um, the one I see a lot is huge steps backward in support for software development lifecycle processes, like configuration management, like debugging, like the ability to you know, understand what your code is, because the code is composed of both you know, code snippets and configuration. Uh, there's you know, very few integrated development environments that support these things. And then you have developers that come to these environments, because it's so easy to get into, point, click, point, click, and you build an application, they generally don't come from software engineering backgrounds, and so they will come up to you, like feral children, they're awesome, they come up to you and they go, hey, my favorite platform just got this cool new feature where every change you make is recorded somewhere, and you can go back in time if you want to and see that, and you're like, yeah, we call that configuration management, and we had that in the 70s, and we've, that's kind of a standard thing for us. And they're so excited because it's so awesome, and ooh, it's, just, it's hard because you know, we're, they're, it's far behind. And so we, we still need all that stuff to control our software development lifecycle as we have. Um, in, in integration with other platforms outside the environment is, is difficult, uh, and also a lot of these platforms, you know, talk about architectural design decisions not being yours. Also, the management of the platform itself is no longer yours because a lot of these things run out in the cloud. And so, you know, it's running outside your security domains, you've got security concerns, you have to integrate your authentication systems, you have to integrate your own on-premises applications, uh, and these are all issues. So, you're an architect, you're responsible for these applications, what can you do? Again, finding your platform is, is a terrible, terrible idea. You know, if you're going to go with one of these things, accept the fact that they've made, you know, architectural design decisions on your behalf. Choose carefully, always do that, and just kind of learn how to live as best you can within that environment, because they do provide value advantages. I mean, they, you can build applications faster and at lower cost and with lower skill levels than you can with on the metal development platforms, but uh, it, you know, it comes at some cost, but fighting it is a bad idea. Uh, building your own mega platform is even worse than building your own framework, and there are some companies out there that can get away with doing this. Um, mainly the larger ones, at which point they'll try to vend it and then they'll add a logo to the, uh, to the, the wall of shame there. Uh, don't build your own mega platform. Um, but kind of, like I said, you know, the, the general good ideas in this, in this regard are you know, figure out how to get as much of good software engineering practices and principles into the mega platform as you can, even though that platform may not natively support them. So establish coding conventions or configuration conventions, whatever you want to call them. Make sure you have some kind of configuration management capability, even if it means manually dumping Excel files or, or XML files into a, a subversion repository or a Git repository periodically. Um, you know, build tools that will help you deploy and, you know, and, and define and, and test these things consistently. Because if you don't have that, you're going to have you know, even bigger problems than you have in traditional software engineering. So 
you know, domain-specific software engineering is here, but it, it turned out not to be the panacea that we thought it was. Agile methods. I love agile methods. Fewer things here. There's a there's a lot of different agile methods. I picked you know some some of the newer the newer ones. I, I do I do think that we they've evolved a long way from extreme programming in terms of you know being able to define how you manage work in a in a system. I I, I do understand the, the benefits of Scrum and things like that. So how does agile development interact with software architecture? And agile development is the top level term we could talk about. It refers to a, you know dozens of different methods, and so it's like you know it's like it's the most, you know, if someone says, I'm doing agile development, you go, great, that tells me almost nothing about what you're doing. So you have to be a little bit more specific. But there are some common threads in agile development. So, like I said earlier, a little bit facetiously, so, you know, there's, uh, there's usually a dynamic backlog of features that need to get implemented. There are very short development cycles. So it's the, you know, the iterative development processes writ large. Um, uh, <laughs> dynamic iterative development cycles, and every time you finish a cycle, uh, you've delivered some demonstrable functionality, which is a good thing because we're constantly showing progress. We're not just building, you know, frameworks for framework's sake. Here. We have to be delivering functionality, and that's one of the value propositions of Agile. Uh, but the interesting one is the is this one I think, which is that you are supposed to defer decision making until the last responsible moment, and that is defined as the point of which the cost of not making the decision exceeds the cost of making it, whether you got it wrong or not. Uh, and what that says is, you know, and, the, and that, that means you're making a lot more local decisions because we're implementing these features this week. We're not, you know, looking at the big project product level. We're looking at individual features. What are we building? What functionality are we getting, you know, in this sprint? And how do I achieve that? Uh, there's a principle in Agile development called YAGNI, which stands for Yank Gonna Need It, which is uh, it's kind of a backlash against architecture and top-level design. And so what it says is, you know, all you architecture astronauts out there that build these grand frameworks and these grand abstractions and these, you know, things where you have, you know, you know, object factory factories and things like that, that's all well and good. But you know, when you, by the end of development, after you've built all of these different things, you ain't gonna need it. You find out that you know you you plan for 58 special cases and you had zero special cases and the happy path was always the thing. So you have all this additional infrastructure to, to support, which is bad news. Um, and that's you know that's probably true in some sense, but there has to be some balance again between how do we imbue these systems with top level properties across the whole system and maintain conceptual integrity across the system when we're doing things very iteratively and very locally. And so I see Agile, if you do it kind of purely and you don't imbue architecture into that design process, as creating emergent rather than constructed design. So rather than an intentional design where I said, this is going to be the design of my system up front, and then I slowly kind of build that out and fill in that design as I work, the design of the system actually emerges from a whole lot of local decisions. And as we know, Emergent behavior is very hard to predict and control compared to intentional behavior. And so it can be a good thing because you know you get the agility, you get the ability to redirect every two weeks, but you've got to make sure that you have something good as you kind of go along with that. And so another continuous, you know, another common thread of agile development is continuous refactoring. And that is to say, and this is one that if you ignore it, I think you ignore it at your peril, which is to say, as you change your mind and as you yagni and as you make local design decisions, when you realize you've changed something significant. You have to go back and fix up all the other things that aren't consistent with that decision so you maintain the conceptual integrity of your system. This is one of those principles that if you kind of ignore it, Agile doesn't work quite so well. Issues with Agile, you know, it's easy for top level designs to get lost or not done at all. You know, if you're doing pure Agile, I don't know when the top level design actually gets, you know, documented or written down. That probably lives in the heads of the developers if there is one. Um, I worry about architectures that kind of you know, emerge as agglomerations or there's a, there's a facetious paper out there on the web called the Big Ball of Mud Architectural Style where we just made design decisions and kept slapping it on the big ball of mud and at the end that's our architecture, big ball of mud. Um, in Agile that's, that's a, a real possibility but you know, it's something to be avoided, it's something to be watching out for that, that intentional or top down design kind of doesn't have that much risk. And an interesting thing about Agile I think is that Unlike traditional design, you know, Agile says you should do all of these things, like you should do test-first development, or you should do, you know, you should uh, 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 do, you know, do documentation first and then do the implementation. And all of those things, you know, because there's no one Agile method, and there's, there's no one way, right way to do it, people like to take parts of Agile and they kind of develop, build their own Agile method together by taking the bits and pieces that they like and putting it together and saying, see, we're doing Agile. Every single part of our method comes from Agile. 
It turns out that there's interdependencies between a lot of those rules of doing agile development, especially in the more mature methods, and those interdependencies are there for reasons, which is like, okay, well, I don't need to do you know, architecture, I don't need to do this. People go, great, I don't have to do design anymore. And it's like the only reason that works is because you're supposed to do this other thing, which is test first development. So you, you know, if you pick the part of Agile that's like, I don't want to do top-down design, yay. And you don't pick the part that says, I have to do test-driven development to make that work, bad things happen. And you, that's the thing. So you have to be very, very careful about what parts of Agile. You know, everybody assembles their own Agile method, but you have to pick the parts of Agile that go together in a way that generates quality software. So what can you do? Um, as I said, you know, I, I don't think Agile is going away. I do think it has a value proposition in terms of you know, the ability to redirect as you go. Um, uh, I think doing you know, YAGME without refactoring is the worst thing you can do because that's going to lead to a system that really is the big ball of mud. You know, you're always just going to be building functionality, but you're not going to care how the whole cohesive whole comes together. And you're going to have problems with maintainability, and you're going to have problems with consistency of the software, and you're probably going to have a lot of bugs and stuff. You just don't know where they come from. Uh, the, 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 the alternative to that is continuous refactoring. That is to say, whenever you change your mind about how you're building the system again, you have to go back and you have to fix up all the places in the system where you didn't think that way. And that's a big cost. You know, this is not something that easily fits into a two-week sprint all the time. But if you're not doing that, your software is going to kind of become more and more internally diverse and less, you know, have less and less conceptual integrity. And that's a big, huge problem. Um, in the middle, you know, I, I think there is opportunities for in, you know, kind of combining traditional upfront design or doing a design sprint or things like that. People do that where they do some of these traditional upfront designs and they kind of incorporate that into Agile. And that may or may not work for your group. I mean, you know, it, it really depends on what kind of system you're building and how important that top level architecture is to it, achieving all of its goals. Um, you can also kind of, you know, have, you know, you can have do Agile in the context of, okay, we've made these principal design decisions, that's going to be our style. So whenever we make the local decisions, we're going to do it in a way that's consistent with that. That's, that's a good way to do Agile. And, um, <coughs> Of course, you know, end-to-end -end integration testing is always, that's a part of, I think, all of Agile. Agile is a lot more about unit testing and making sure these particular features work, but doing that end-to-end -end testing periodically, especially when you have top-level illities or qualities to deal with, is, is really important. And the, final, uh, the final challenge to architecture that I've seen lately, especially in, in my world, is, uh, is leaking abstractions. So these, are, uh, these logos are newer than some of those other ones. Um, a lot of them are from a world called DevOps. How many of you have heard of DevOps? DevOps is very, very hot right now. Um, DevOps says that you, know, you can no longer maintain that beautiful abstraction layer between your, develop, your system developers and the people who are going to deploy and operate it at some point. And that used to be really, really great when you were an architect because you could totally ignore a group of people that spoke a different language than you and that kind of looked funny and worked on a bunch of different things that you did. And since we're all antisocial anyway, that was great. But unfortunately, we can't get away with that anymore because what's happening is that the technologies we use to deploy and manage software after it's deployed uh, are now encroaching on the actual properties and the qualities of the software we're building. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, the physical architecture, the deployment architecture of the system is something we used to be able to you know, the physical views, yeah, it's part of 4 plus 1, it's part of, part of UML and all that, but we were able to blindly ignore a lot of that, especially late into the development process, because we focused on the logical architecture. But now, how we deploy it and how the software is laid out and how we manage it actually influences, like I said, the, the logical qualities of the software, and that's largely coming from this world of DevOps technologies. Another phenomenon that's related that we see uh, at, at our company, because we built a lot of high-performance stuff, is that the actual hardware your software is running on, in terms of the accelerator cards, the GPUs, the clusters, and things like that, the structure of that hardware greatly influences the structure of your software because how you're able to parallelize and break up the work of a high performance application uh, <coughs> depends on what kind of hardware you're going to run on. So you can't build these applications in a completely abstract way anymore and just deploy it and expect them to perform. You know, how you, what you deploy it on and how you build the software can have a 2x, 10x, 100x difference in performance in, in the actual system. So what, what comes out here? Well, one of the value propositions, and this is one of the interesting things that's happening with DevOps, is a lot of the properties we want to imbue in our software, for example, reliability or you know, uh, robustness, uh, instead of building those into the software itself, we can actually outsource that to part of the ops. So we move that concern from dev to ops. That is to say, if I'm using containers, Docker containers, for example, with a system, a container management system like Kubernetes, it doesn't matter if you don't understand what these things are. It's a, it's a way to package and deploy software. 
If I build my software in containers, and I manage those containers with Kubernetes, I can now get some reliability out of the ops. That is to say, that piece of that that external piece of infrastructure, which I don't know if that's part of my software system or not. I certainly didn't code it, but it's part of the deployment architecture of my system. Gives me reliability because it will detect when a server or a component goes down or gets overloaded, and it will redirect traffic to a different component. And it will, uh, you know, it'll detect if a whole data center goes down, and it'll redirect all my network traffic to a different coast and things like that. And so that's actually kind of a good thing, right? So I have this thing that I didn't really have to build or write into my system that's giving me a quality that I probably wanted, probably would have had to spend a lot of, uh, a lot of time building. But the problem is, is now I have to concern with myself with the operation of that thing. I can't ignore that. I can't say, you know, I'll worry about that when I get down to the, you know, to the deployment of my system. I actually have to start considering the deployment architecture of my system right when I start building it. Um, there's also this push to virtualize or containerize legacy applications. So we've got you know, monolithic or distributed legacy applications. And now we want to be able to break those up so we can take advantage of these wonderful containerization systems and Kubernetes and Dockers. But all of that impacts how I actually construct the software out of components, how those components communicate with each other, how those components manage the dependencies between each other and, and other things. Um, and, and now I have to keep that in mind. Um, also, you know, everything, uh, usual issues with emerging technology issues, Department of Redundancy Department there, sorry. Um, the, uh, uh, th these technologies are all very new. And so, you know, that will settle out over time. But, you know, these are exciting. We want to take advantage of them. But there's, again, so many of them, and they, we're not quite sure how they all are going to interact and who's going to win the, win the wars there. So what can you do? Um, you could ignore it and hope that all these trends go away and we go back to... Uh, traditional component-based software engineering, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I think what you really do have to do is you really do have to t you know, take advantage as, as an architect of these technologies. And you have to get your dev and your ops people together in a room, as painful as that's going to be. And you know, I don't know, buy them sandwiches or something, or you know, make them talk to each other, because the, uh, the capabilities of both sides are, are really impacting each other. And so understanding how the software is architected and understanding how the software is eventually going to be deployed, you can't separate those concerns anymore. So these abstractions have leaked, but you know, do your best to take advantage of the, of the good things that can happen because of that. Uh, and then you know, whether you want to refactor your legacy applications or not, that's a, that's a very difficult architectural decision. That's something you do want good architects and stakeholders looking at. Because you know, it's the, there is a value proposition to be achieved here, but that refactoring can be big and painful, uh, especially if you have monolithic applications before. And so taking a monolithic application and just wrapping it in a big container and dumping it out there and saying, yay, we do containers, you might not have bought yourself anything doing that. Because the value proposition of containers happens when things get smaller, things get more, you know, more agile, more item potent from each other. So yes, it's a bad time to be a software architect. So much so that I left the entire profession and went over to be an IT guy, and that's okay. But you know, some of you will remain software architects. I'm sorry about that uh, for you. You know, for you, I think your your role as software architects is still important. Uh, but that that whole notion that software architecture is a top-down discipline where you get to you know make these wonderful decisions and then just go implement. Uh, I think that that role of the architect is going to diminish. We're going to move from architecture in the large, kind of top-down prescriptive architecture to architecture in the small, where we actually focus on principles and design principles that are viewed throughout a system instead of from the top-down structure of the system. Uh, uh, likewise, I think instead of being highly prescriptive, I think <coughs> architecture is going to be emergent and that kind of continuous refactoring to make sure we maintain those principles across the system in every little and big design decision we make is going to be critical. Uh, you're going to have to maintain conceptual integrity. I'm a big fan of the concept of conceptual integrity. That's something that Fred Brooks uh, kind of espoused in, in the Mythical Man Month. And conceptual integrity basically says, if I've learned something about how a system works over here, and I look over here, it works the same way. It's just a, it's just a matter of consistency in, in all things, right? It means that you know, if I solve a problem one way over here, I solve a problem the same way over here. And that's not normal. You have to work at that. And that's what continuous refactoring is all about. And if you do that, your systems will be maintainable and will be understandable by people, and you will be able to have successful systems that perform well and are reliable. And they may actually exist without top-down architecture. And that's really interesting, but it's a very different way of thinking about it. And then, you know, even when you're in a platform or a framework where they haven't quite caught up to the 70s in software engineering and software development lifecycle technologies, you still have to do your best. It's still on you as the trained software engineer and architect to, uh, 
to manage that as best you can and, and bring those capabilities in even where they don't exist. So, and then my lawyers made me put this up here. So I, we don't own any of these trademarks. They were really mad that I put a bunch of logos up there, but it's okay. <laughs> this is put it as plain right at the end. So thank you. It's great to see you all. I guess we have a minute or two for questions maybe, but. Do I need a microphone? Or, oh, okay, so um, I really enjoyed your talk, and I, I kind of knew what to expect in terms of the uh, the intellectual um, uh, load and the the speed with which you're going to deliver these things, and and, and how how fast my brain was going to have to work to process this. But a part of it I find a little bit disconcerting in the sense that what you did in this talk is kind of like the American Medical Association saying, look, this is the range of behaviors, and these behaviors are bad, and, or the, the Surgeon General, right? And then and the Surgeon General recommends that you do these kinds of things. And that's, it's great. It's very educational. I feel like I learned a lot. What, what I felt was almost missing was you taking a stand, and maybe you're not ready to take that stand, and say, look, having mega platforms is bad. Having devs, DevOps, in my opinion, is bad in these specific ways. In other words, I'd like, you know, kind of strip everything else away and all the responsibility that you have to, you know, uh, your constituency, both this crowd and the people at work. How do you feel about this? Is this, is this a good thing? Is, is everybody builds their own agile um, uh, process or processes? Uh, is that the, the world that we live in? Yeah, we have to face that reality, but is that a good reality? Is that something we should just accept and move on? Or... Um, you know, are you really deeply unhappy with this? <laughs> <laughs> so I would have answered this question very differently many years ago. Um, I was born a very conservative baby, and so I always thought that everything, I was registered Republican at two years old, and you know, it was great. I've changed a little bit since then, I've slid. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I would have said, yes, there's a right way and a wrong way to do this, and these trends are bad, and these trends are not. It's interesting that you bring up the, the American Medical Association because there's a phenomenon in public health policy called harm reduction. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with this, but it basically says, you know, people are going to do bad things. And yes, it's, it's an awful, awful thing that they do bad things. And should we support them doing bad things in ways that are less harmful? So we're not trying to eliminate the bad behavior. We're just trying to help those people do the bad behavior in a less harmful way. So hopefully, you know, and, and there's a big debate over that, right? Does that encourage people doing harmful behaviors? You know, it's like, should we, you know, should we endeavor to sell safer cigarettes or something like that? You know, these are bad examples. These are all very controversial. I don't want to get into that. But it's, it's kind of, I, you know, I kind of think, you know, because, because the, the upshot is, is, is the, the advocacy for harm reduction says, the reason you should do harm reduction is because since people are going to do this anyway, you will get a better, real, you know, realistic outcome in the real world by, by doing harm reduction than you will by trying to vociferously you know, try to eliminate the bad behaviors. And I've come to a point in my life where I, I've just kind of, I don't like that, but I've accepted it. And so this, this talk is a PN for harm reduction in the software engineering community, which is to say, I can't stop the proliferation of frameworks. They're too easy and fun to build. I can't stop the proliferation of mega platforms. Companies like mine will send wheelbarrows of money to people who build mega platforms to get this value. And so all I can do as an architect and as a practical manager is kind of say, you know, given that these things are happening, what, what can I do to maintain at least some of the goodness of software architecture? And so, you know, would I love to step back and say, you know, frameworks should really be derived from software architectural styles? Yes, I absolutely believe that. I've built software on frameworks like that, and the goodness that comes out of it is so much better than just picking a random framework that's out there. But what are you going to do? You know, we're, you know, it's 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 architecture, not architecture, out in the world. The world is eating <laughs> software. You know, I, you know. Roy and others built us this wonderful platform called the web, right? And it wasn't really necessarily built for the kinds of applications that we want to put out there, okay? It was built for hypertext and document management. And we have shoehorned it and done so many different things to make it even possible. But it's like, if you were, if you were architecting, if we knew we wanted to build the kind of applications we do today, would we have built the web like we did? No, of course we wouldn't have built the web like we did. We built the web like we did because of a million emergent decisions that got us to that point. We would have designed a completely separate system, but we didn't. And we didn't because that's the way the world is. That's the way the market is. That's the way development is. And there's nothing we can do about that 
except do our best to mitigate all of the crap that happened because of the, you know, because the world emerged like it did. You know, I've, 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 I've told this story before. Why is JavaScript a popular language? Because Brendan Eich didn't have a date one weekend in 1995 and was around to build it into Netscape 1.0. It wasn't the greatest language ever. It wasn't even a good language. I mean, he could have just picked Python and it would have been so much better for the world, but he didn't. So if you have a time machine, kill Hitler, go to 1990, after you kill Hitler, go to 1995, find Brendan Eich and get him a date that weekend. Because it will make software engineering so much better for us. There's just, it's the world we live in. So I, I, I appreciate your question, but I'm too old and too tired to, to fight. <laughs> Dr. Fielding, you honor us with your presence. Since you asked for this question, <laughs> go back to your first or really your second slide that defines software architecture. Yes, sir. This is completely wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> good. It's not a set of principal design decisions. That's that's something. Architecture is what you design. How often is architecture what you design? Almost never. You have architecture design. And you have architecture reality, and if you try to build it a science off of architecture design, you will fail every time because you never have purity in design. Or you have purity in design, you never have purity in architecture. So if you talk about the set of principal designs that you've made for this wonderful piece of, piece of architecture, say it to be a building like this one, and one of the builders drives a truck through the basement by accident uh, while you're building it, do you tell the builders that, okay, build according to the principal design, or do you patch it up until you get to the point where it has a certain actual architecture which still survives with the, 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 the needs to keep the building standing up? It's like you go with what you have there. You talk about architecture in terms of what it is rather than what is, how it's designed to be. So if, if you want the way I describe it is, yes, software architecture as it exists today is a terribly dismal science. But that's because many of us have defined it as being shit that you do. I, if, if, you, if you define software architecture as the things that a lead or senior architect does within a company, including management, uh, employee allocation, um, six-year plans for the company, uh, negotiating with executives, trying to make your <coughs> most reliable customers happiest, all those things, if you define it as all those things, we'll never get to the point where we have a science of architecture. But if you define architecture as the way the systems actually work, then what you will discover is the people who are actually building architecture were already in the DevOps world in the 90s. They were already building systems that way in the 90s. <coughs> They just weren't called architects. And, and you know, I, I don't think there's a good, you know, response. I, th that's a long discussion, but I'll just respond and say, I, you know, I, I am coming. I, I think what I tried to apply here is I'm, I'm coming around to that view that you know, architecture is more emergent than prescribed. That you know, that, that a, a good architecture may exist in the small and across the world, right? You know, rather than being, you know, th this this kind of, again, it's this kind of top level prescribed thing and. And I, I don't know what that means for the science of architecture that I learned and contributed to. And so this is this is part of that journey. And I, I, I sympathize and, and agree in a, lot, a lot with your position. I don't think this is necessarily, this decision is, in, this, this definition is incompatible with it, but it implies, like you said, certain things about where those design decisions come from and when they occur that I think is probably different than it actually was when I thought about this the first time. I, I have to push back on that. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will be the last one because there's no, more people got, wanting to ask questions. It'll be real short, I okay. promise. <laughs> <laughs> Roy, it's spelled P-A-L, not P-L-E. Don't make that confusion because Alex Wolf did exactly the same thing in a keynote talk number, number of years ago. It's what's there as opposed to what should be there. No, I, I actually didn't notice the spelling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so, so we have a question. Oh, hold on I, for her. I, yeah. I just want to quick comment on the original question. And I think one of the things that the community should be building is write these best current practice of what to do 
so that it's easily consumable for people looking for how do I do blah, blah, blah. And at the same time, we should have what not to do and the whole series of these are sort of lessons learned so that uh, the diversity of solutions and architectures out there, you, if you're looking for a solution, a platform architecture, you pick what fits your needs and your requirements. And like I said, careful choice of all these things is, is critical. And you have to know what your choices are and do these things open-eyed. And, so, and yeah. one of the secrets of the IETF, the Engineering Review Task Force, that they have documented best current practices, BCPs, on what to do for emails or whatever. And, and that's how you communicate the right way and uh, propagate success, hopefully. You have another comment over there? Yeah, I'm just pushing back again a little bit more <laughs> in, in, in a little different way. Um, I, I agree with what you said, but I also agree. Uh, so and when I saw that, I thought, yeah, the principal design decisions, AL, as we go along in the development of the system, that's basically where the architecture is. Note that that's the principal design decisions, not the principal design principles, LES, <laughs> that, we're, that we're started out with necessarily. Yeah, I don't see a difference there. Are, are you okay. still talking about decisions? Design decisions, decisions you you <laughs> what I'm saying is you make decisions as you go along in reaction to things that happen in the world. And those decisions are basically where the architecture comes. Not where, not the principles, LES, mm -hmm. that you started out with for decisions at the very beginning that wound up being modified and changed along the way. Another question. So, uh, great talk. Thank you. Uh, it resonates with me a lot. Uh, I want to know, like, is there a right way of teaching software architecture to undergrads or grads, or should we even teach <coughs> software architecture, or should it be like emergent? They should learn it like as they go and dive into the industry. Okay, it should be emergent in that way. So there's a book that you should <laughs> use yeah. when you teach this class. Okay. Make sure time. everyone buys it new, yeah. not you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've, we, you know, we, we've tried. I mean, you know, is there a right way? There is an evolving right way. I know it's lunchtime, and there's closer sessions no, 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 no. than us. She's giving you the flyer. Oh, don't. Oh. don't oh. 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 I, I, I mean, <laughs> she's just there. <laughs> we, we have enough money. It's OK, except, you know, anyway. Uh, the, uh, it's not that much. You'd be surprised. Uh, I, I think that I, I, what, what I'm trying to say here is that we need to continually reevaluate how we teach software architecture and what we teach as part of software architecture because even, you know, that book is very much telling the academic story of software architecture and I'm glad that story was told. I don't think it's told anywhere else. It, it kind of says, you know, here's how software architecture was conceived, you know, by Perry and Wolf and people before that and how the academic story of software architecture evolved and intertwined with the industrial story. Um, but the world is encroaching on this discipline and what it means to do architecture and what it means to, to be an architect and what it means to design software. You know, how to design software is a class that I've never really seen taught. There, you know, CMU has done a few versions of it. We've done versions of it here. Um, that's really hard to do in general because software is a very abstract thing. It's a very kind of squishy thing. It's, you can't touch it. You can't feel it. You can't visualize it very easily. I was looking at my... Uh, my, my backpack from Wixa, the, work, the software architecture conference in 2001, the logo is just a bunch of symbols pointing at each other that doesn't mean anything. So we don't know what software looks like. I mean, there's no way to visualize. So it's a really hard thing to teach. And just, you know, keeping in mind all of this stuff and trying to, trying to teach the, the general principles. I think the principles of conceptual integrity is going to be around for a while. You know, the principles of consistency and refactoring. But yeah, you know, it's, this is a call to keep thinking about it because we're not going to solve this problem anytime soon. Okay, so we'll break for lunch. Uh, Eric is going to be around for uh, more discussions, I'm sure. Please take advantage of the lunch uh, break to uh, uh, have these uh, fruitful discussions and also visit the poster session downstairs. There we have some. Knowledge. Yeah, so let's thank Eric. Thank you, Eric.